it's now your turn. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, uh, we will have microphones uh, available and we would like you to introduce yourself and then keep your question as short as possible so that we can hear from everybody in the room. Okay, and I think uh, over here, uh, do we have a qu question over here? Yes. Carol, so, yes. Oh, we're trying to get the phone. A Amy? As you're standing up, we, we you know, psychiatric, all of our mental health and substance use is in all these bills as uh, you. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a psych nurse clinical specialist. My name is Maureen Burns Streff. I've been in private practice with my husband and we have several other colleagues since 1979. And I have to tell you one of the difficulties that I'm experiencing these days is with my older patients who are now on Medicare and then the big dilemma for them is what Medigap plan to choose, who will cover me the best way and what I need. And when I turned 65, it was a big shock for me that Medicare doesn't cover a physical exam. And therefore, all the Medigap plans don't cover it either. So tonight, we've heard, I've heard more than 15 times probably the whole issue around prevention. And if someone has, doesn't have, chooses not to have a physical, because they have to pay for it. And I have to tell you, I decided for the last two, three years, I didn't have a physical every year because I didn't want to have to pay all that money out of pocket. And I figured, well, I'm getting my blood pressure checked. They're seeing me periodically. And my patients, some of them are crying saying, I don't have a physical anymore. Now what I'm doing in my practice, I'm a psych nurse clinical specialist, but I'm almost doing a review of systems around, you know, are you looking depressed because your hemoglobin is on the ground? And, you know, or you don't look the way that I think you should look with the medicines that you're on. So I just would like to hear what is the situation in terms of our newly, um, uh, new issues that are coming up around Medicare covering physicals so that we can then prevent things from happening, yep. and then the other insurance companies, the Medigap's doing the same thing. Brian? Thank you. So under, under the bill that was uh, signed yesterday, uh, all Medicare uh, beneficiaries will be entitled to one annual physical every year with no copay whatsoever. And uh, in fact, all preventive services will have no, no copays at all. And that's one of the major advances, and, and I think when some, does when does that start? <laughs> It's pretty it's soon. Pretty I think it's, it's, it's 2011. Early. I think yeah. it's next January, yeah. I think. Yeah. It's not a 2014 purpose. Yeah. No, it's not. OK, another question right here, Amy or Carol? Okay. Carol. Hi, I'm Patrice Organ. I'm in the um, uh, master's program for nursing leadership and business management. Question regarding prevention. Are preventive visits now going to be reimbursable visits? Well, you want to talk about payment for it? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, I think there's the answer that Brian gave earlier, which is an early provision in the bill, which will extend both to Medicare benefits, but it's also contemplated as we think about the new, um, the new plans that will be created. I think it extends yeah. farther. Um, I think that when we think about payment reform, and, you know, it's called various things, you can sort of think of it under the accountable care organization model. I think at the end of the day, what those, the innovations that are, and the innovation opportunities that are created under national reform, frankly, are really all about prevention. I mean, they're really all about, even beyond the rate increases that are gonna flow through the public programs, they're really about empowering providers and empowering the delivery system to invest more deeply in prevention, to invest more deeply in primary care, including um, all, you know, all different kinds of practitioners, not just physicians, to keep people out of the hospital, to keep people out of and needing those really high cost interventionist services that are in many cases avoidable or preventable to provide the financial incentives to eliminate duplicate tests. So I think that there are seeds in this bill to beyond some of the things that we've talked about concretely move farther and really learn about what models, as we talk about payment reform, this is really a whole new world, what models work? 
and to frankly also learn about the delivery system change that's required and at the nitty gritty level of what kind of information technology do you need right. and then to document, evaluate, and then share the lessons across our whole healthcare system. So I think this is sort of what I was trying to get at is there are things there, there are kernels there, there's a lot more to come and a lot more work to do. But if we are successful in, in our state in moving towards a global payment system where, you know, right now there's no money to be made in preventive care. It's just no. not, there's no profit in it. You know, there's providers that set up these group visits for diabetic patients, have 20 diabetic patients and talk together as a group about nutrition and exercise and, and testing and monitoring. And they couldn't bill for that because there's no code for a group visit. If the provider was paid up front an annual fee to say, keep the guy out of the hospital, keep your whole crew out of the hospital, they would love to do group visits and one-on-ones and spend more time with the patient. So we are hopeful that this payment reform will really shift the paradigm. Instead of patching people up when they're sick, and that's how you make your money, instead keeping people healthy will make how well, you make your money. And I picked that up. I mean, I just reflect on my own experience with my kids. You know, if I call my pediatrician's office and I spend 20 minutes on the phone with a nurse coaching me through, okay, do I need to come in? Do I need to go to the ED? There's nothing billable there. But under a global payment model, that that is because you're given essentially you know, a, up a, an upfront payment for all of the care that a patient would need over a given period of time. And if you can figure out how to do that efficiently, you get everything above whatever it costs you. And so it's, I think it's a really wild, I think change is scary. Um, it's actually, I think, really intended to be an empowering model um, for providers, um, and particularly for people who are in the side of the delivery system that you guys are, who are working on prevention and primary care. Okay. But um, but I want to say that there is. A, I, I don't. For us, oh, sorry. My name is Kathleen Apper. I'm a nurse practitioner student. Um, I'm doing a practicum at Harvard Vanguard, and they model their practice uh, to Kaiser Permanente's mm -hmm. uh, shared medical appointment, and they see up to ten patients in ninety minutes, and they bill for it, yeah. and it's a wonderful program. Yeah. These people are so empowered. They come in and they say, "Doctor, I'm having this." They talk to each other about what's going on. Right. It's it's really amazing. And, and that is half of Harvard Vanguard patients, and I count myself uh, among them, um, are in fact paid under this global payment model that we're all talking they about. Are? So half of their model is under global payments, and that's why they can do that. Already? Yep. Yeah, it's oh, about 20% okay. of Massachusetts. As a whole state. Right now. But it's really uh -huh. But 80% are in this same hmm. old fee for service. Can I just ask a question? Carol, uh, hold on just a sec. Car uh, Carol, right here. People over here. Okay, sorry. Loudly. I'm Sandy Ryder, I'm in the MP program. Just how, do, how will they gauge the um, successfulness of the, of, uh, will there be benchmarks for the physicians to be able to prove that they were successful in keeping their patients healthy? And when will they get paid? At the end of the year or up front, as you said? Um, so I think one of the things that I, um, Right now, while in Massachusetts there were recommendations made about a kind of statewide model, in fact, the way where we are right now, so those 20% of physician payments that are coming through global payments are really determined by individual contractual negotiations between providers and health plans. And we have one plan, um, I work for their affiliated foundation, that's really pushing hard into this space. Some of the 20% is also, frankly, old relationships left over from the days of capitation that never ended. So you have um, Harvard, um, Harvard Pilgrim still pays a fair amount, and particularly have been physicians under old style global payments. Capitation models. You've got Fallon, um, uh, Mount Auburn. Community Health Plan. Mount Auburn, Mount Auburn does under those under all of those payers. So um, each of those has its own different quality measures that are built into those global payments. And I think one of the challenges, and I think in moving forward is finding a way to make that, I would argue, we need to establish some common rules of the road. We need to get to some consensus about what is the menu, whether it's 40 or 20, whatever, what are really the critical measures of quality so that we ensure, so that we can answer that question, um, so that we can ensure that patients are being provided all the care they need. Um, that this, because one of the risks with these kinds of payment models is it can provide incentives um, to do less than people need. And so the, the sort of, um, the way to prevent that from happening is having good outcome measures and good measures around chronic diseases and other things to make sure that all the things that we know clinically you should do, those patients are getting. So I think there's a lot of innovating going in that space. The science of measurement 
students advanced dramatically in the last 15 years. Um, clearly, we've seen at the federal level an interest to invest more deeply, but we, we do have a lot more work to do. And, and we would add that it, it needs to be transparent. Mm -hmm. So the measures that are used need to be open so the patients can see how their doctors and hospitals are being judged. And, and that's open for public discussion. It's a public issue. And I think one of the things we're seeing in state level reform and federal level reform is a whole new level of really pushing from the government to say we do need to be transparent yeah. and to and break down those historic barriers to keep everything close. And I would add, you know, Melissa, when she ran Commonwealth Care, they mm -hmm. had some very serious quality indicators that they checked their mm -hmm. providers on and really uh, kept tabs on how well they were doing. And I know yeah. that was important. Mm -hmm. Let's take a question from this side of the room. Stephanie, did you want to say anything? You're, uh, the new, newly appointed head of the uh, connector. Is there anything you want to? I don't have anything much to say yet. <laughs> <laughs> I must Smart tell, I must tell you, she took my email address, so I think I'll be invited next year. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> OK, back over here. Is there someone oh, over yes, here at the someone. side? Yes. Oh. Sure. Um, the notion behind competition is creating an environment where you're creating the best value for the recipient. So um, without getting too arcane, one of the things that was done uh, for Commonwealth Care, and it has the, toim the term prudent purchasing has been um, used to describe it, is uh, when trying to establish what the rates are it's tough, particularly for Commonwealth Care. We didn't have any history. It was a, a population that was sort of split between people who had been using the uncompensated care pool and then people who were going to be newly insured. So one of the things that was developed, and I have to confess, when it was initially done, uh, it was created by my colleague, Patrick Holland, who came from commercial insurance, um, didn't know anything about Medicaid, and frankly, I thought he was insane, but I was stuck with him. And I, actually, somebody referred to him is my work husband. That's how much time we spent together. So he said, well, auto assignment, which is the practice where people who don't pick a plan or assign to a plan, might be something that we could offer to the lowest cost plan. The thinking being that people who auto assign are not self-selected because they don't have an immediate need for care, so they might be healthier. So we created a model where the plans that bid a lower cost within the range we gave them, because we needed to make sure that they were financially viable and they were making a profit, got a larger portion of the auto assignment. You know, Brian might want to speak to this. It was extremely controversial. I had some board members that were not pleased with it. We had to make some changes as time went on. But by creating the competition for the healthier payments, and I know this probably sounds a little bit crass, but the point that you made, unfortunately, it is about money. And healthcare is a huge business. And we need to treat it like a business, I think, in order to make sure that it's sustainable. By creating that competition, we were able to keep the rates down. Now, as Brian said, we had very, very strict quality um, measures. And CMS does not give you a lot of latitude. So I don't want to just describe this as something that's sort of capricious. But by really getting the plans to look at what they needed in order to maintain a successful financial model, and with one exception, they have all been not hugely profitable, but moderately pro profitable almost every single quarter that the program was launched. So that's sort of what we're talking about there. A lot of it's about transparency, and a lot of it is about really, um, again, challenging what has sort of been known assumptions. Okay. Although, I, if I could push back for the purposes of, of a little I'm shocked discussion. you're going to push back. <laughs> no, but n not on your point, Melissa, because I think the way the connector uh, did it was accountable competition and guided competition mm -hmm. in some ways. So in our hospital market in Massachusetts, we have no accountability and no real guidance. It's a free market, and everybody's out to negotiate the best deal they can get. And the goal is if everybody's negotiating, we're gonna, prices in general are going to come down. But we, the Attorney General did a study of our hospitals and how much they're charging. So there's a, roughly a two to one gap between what the highest hospitals get paid and what the cheapest hospitals get paid for the same service. So double in price. So why are some getting twice as much than others? First, she looked at quality. But the quality was the same at all the hospitals. So it's not that you're paying more for quality. Then she looked, well, maybe some hospitals are teaching hospitals, and they have, they have more extra teaching expenses. 